I want to continue today um, in the book of Genesis, and, and we're not going to get out of Genesis 6 today. And I'm a little conflicted in, in, uh, in the message because have you ever heard those messages before that when somebody speaks for a long, long time, but you don't really hear the Word of God? In other words, you don't hear Scripture being spoken. I try to be very careful about that, that I don't do much, much talking and I really allow the Scripture to speak. But, but I'm, I'm going to do a concept today, just a little piece in between where you're just going to have to hear me for a minute. But it's important. So, where we've been so far, in case today you're visiting uh, with us, as we've been going through the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, we see creation that takes place. God created it. He has six days of creation, and five days, in the first five days, God created, and He said it was good. On day six, He made, he made the land animals, and then He made man and woman, and He said it was very good. And then it says on the seventh, and God rested. Not that He needed rest, but to give us an example that there's times we need rest. And then he goes into Genesis chapter 2, um, where we see an, a more detailed approach of looking at the relationship just of man and woman. God specifically goes back into the creation of them. It tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed into him the breath of life. The Holy Spirit, uh, God's breath itself breathed in to man, and man became a living soul. That's the difference between humans and anything else. God has, He has created a soul inside. And, and so we, we went through the responsibilities of men and women, biblically speaking. And then we get into Genesis chapter 3. Y'all remember Genesis chapter 3 that there's Adam and Eve and they're in the garden and here's that old sin comes into the world, you know. There's a temptation of sin. There is the actual act of sin. We know the temptation is, is eating, sin enters, and then all of a sudden there's judgment. God comes through in chapter 3. He says, because sin has entered the world there will be judgment. But even in that God extends grace it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he, he talks to the devil and he, he lets him know in that verse that, hey, your seed and her seed will be at battling one another. And your seed will bite at the heel of man, but her seed will stomp the head of what it is you're attacking. It was a picture of what was to come. Then we get into Genesis chapter 4. We see good family times, don't we? You know, we see those first children come in and they have uh, fights and arguments a little bit further than what we, hopefully our children have fights and arguments. And we know that, that uh, y'all, my daughter just winked at me. I love you, baby. It's good to see you. I hadn't seen her. She just showed up. I don't know where she came from. I'm sorry, that just got me. Um, but, but with that, we, we see that a brother is killed. We see sin continuing to enter. Chapter 5 was a book of genealogies and show the great population that takes place uh, on the earth. And then we get into Genesis chapter 6 where we see that uh, we've got this great population. We've got some kind of relationship um, that is happening that God is not pleased with. He tells us in Genesis chapter 6 around verse 5 that man has become so wicked that his mind, his heart is continually, daily, without stop, on wicked imaginations. And so what does God do? Again, sin's entered. There's a price of sin. There's judgment. And we know God is getting ready to flood the earth. You know, I made a statement last week. A young and the restless has nothing on the Bible. Amen? Let me ask you this. Is it real? Do you really believe what the Bible says. Do you believe God created us? I'm speaking to everybody, but men, I'm really speaking to you for a second here. Do you believe what God's Word says? Do you understand why there's death, why there's sickness, why there is all of the evil that is happening in the world today? Do you really understand that that's sin? Do you, do you really believe that as God is sitting here, uh, as we see in Scripture, that God became uh, so grieved 
that He brought judgment on the world with the exception of one family, and that there was a flood that annihilated the world as we know it. I ask you, do you really believe this? And you know, most of the response I got was, yeah. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Do we really believe? When I ask that question, the reason I ask is, if we believe that, and we believe what Scripture says, do we truly make decisions in life from that standpoint? <coughs> I want to talk for a minute about a worldview, and you've heard me speak of this before. Um, in, in one of the great blessings, I taught for several years in, in a Christian school, and um, you know, I, I just, I cannot say enough for that time that I was able to do that. Uh, my children were in school at the time, to be able to, to teach Bible especially, but even science, which I love. Math, which I thought it was funny I was teaching because my math's different than their math, but they all succeeded somehow. <laughs> but the first thing in the first couple of weeks of school, we would over and over talk about the worldview. It was, it was taught an understanding of looking at things different. And here's what I mean by a worldview. Um, we all make decisions off of something that has affected us in life. It's kind of the place that, that we get our, our grounding, our anchor from. For instance, if I had, a, had an apple, um, a botanist would want to classify that apple. If, if it was a pretty apple and we had an artist in here, they may would look at that apple and say, man, that's, that's something living and it's uh, still life and it's beautiful and i got to draw it. They would see something different. You know, the grocer would take that apple and say, that's merchandise. <laughs> I'm going to price it and I'm going to put it in. Um, your kid, if you told them, whatever you do, don't eat this apple, would say lunch. <laughs> right? We would look at it all different from where we are and what we have received or been trained to classify or think is important in our life. If I take this table right here, which I'm just noticing uh, does not have a flower on it. Beautiful table as we're sitting there. If you really look, I'm guessing these tables have been with the church real close to 100 years of the 113 years that, that we've been here. They're very sturdy. If you've ever picked one up, you'll know what I mean there. But um, to, to a, a carpenter, when he would look at that, he would say, now somebody's done a good job with that. To an artist, again, they could look at, at the detail of the wood grain that is in there and just see something living and beauty that came with it. If I'm cold, and I'm like, really, really cold, that's firewood. <laughs> you know, it's all in, again, how we're shaped. I, I could go on with all kinds of things. Let me use another analogy that I don't have to throw an image in front of you. Let's just talk about church for a minute. What is church? To, to a, a, a seasoned Christian, they see church from a biblical perspective that church is not a building, but it is the individuals, the body of Christ is the church. All gifted in certain, uh, certain unique ways, but the same all together. Made specifically for a purpose where the whole body comes together. Other people would see churches, that's that place you go to when, when you know you've really done something wrong and, and you know God's mad at you. And so you got to go and there's, there's, you got to ask for forgiveness because if you don't ask for forgiveness and you die, you're going to hell. And over and over, the next time that you do some sin, there's that thought, I've got to get back to church so I can ask for forgiveness. It's an incorrect thought, but some people do look at church that way. Others see church and they say, that's the biggest building of hypocrites I've ever seen in my life. Because somewhere they've been injured in church. Somebody's misled them. Christian people are still people. Amen. You see, people can look at, at same things we see today and see them all different. So, so where am I going with all of this? Just, just deal with me for a second here. World view is how we are going to see the entire world. It's the defining point. It's the anchor as we look at things. There's three questions when we start talking about a worldview that come into play. The first one is, where did I come from and, and um, why am I here? 
anybody will ask that question. It comes sometime in their life, whether they're a Christian or not. They want to know, where did I come from and what's my purpose? Secondly, it does not take a rocket scientist to understand that there are some broken things in this world. Amen? And so the second question is, why is the world so broken? And what is it that I can do that can change that? And the third thing uh, is just that. How is it going to be fixed? Because we love to fix things. So those are, are three of many questions, but, but those are the founding questions of understanding a worldview. And we understand as Christians that we can look at that. The, the Christian sees God's creation as uh, where do we come from? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28 says that God made us. Male and female, He created us. We see that that's where we came from. What's wrong uh, with us today, or what's wrong with the world? There's the curse of sin. Genesis chapter 3 gives us an understanding why there's sickness, why there's cancers, why there's heart attacks, why there are evil people doing evil things. It all tells us in Genesis chapter 3. And what's going to be done to fix it? It's Genesis chapter 3, 15. We will not fix it. God will through His Redeemer. That's how the Christian sees everything in the world. Now, the naturalist or individuals in the world sometimes, they see things a little bit different. Where did I came from? I am a group of random occurrences that happen to just take place with some big bangs and, and some molecules and some other things that come into play. What's wrong with the world today is we're just tearing it up. We're, we're messing the world up. And how can we fix it if we just recycle a little bit more, if we just conserve a little bit more, if we stop cutting down our trees, all which are good things. Don't get me wrong in what I'm saying. But it's a thought process that I can change it all and save the world. And that's just not what the Bible says. God says the world's in decay because of sin, and only He will be able to redeem it through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, enough time as, as we look at this. Why am I talking about this worldview? We're in Genesis chapter 6, and I asked you when we look at Scripture that do, do you believe these things happen, and, and do you make decisions in life? Why am I looking at that? I, I tell you, I think the church is failing. I, I'm just going to be honest with you, and, and I'm not, look, look today this is it's Father's Day. This is not doom and gloom. We're going to leave here with a, with a I hope, encouragement, but, but I, I just would be wrong not to to say what God has on my heart. So today's message has no judgment in it. There's not judgment for anybody. So if you feel like you're being judged by the preacher today, get over it because I have no judgment. It, it is nothing but complete mercy that I want to speak with you today because I, I want real change to take place. And if there's going to be change in those around us, it's going to start with us. And men, I'm going to tell you, as, as we get closer to the end of this sermon, I, I'm going to ask you for some things. Um, and and I, I'm going to ask it from the Bible, biblically, what God is calling us to do. But, but we've got to examine this for real. Where are we failing? Almost all that the Church of America does today, and I don't care what denomination, is to try to get you converted, to get you saved. And that's important, isn't it? It's the starting point. But we seem to stop there with the message. We've, we've lost our support of, of really growing in understanding how my life is to change. It's, it's discipleship. It's becoming learner of, of what God has called us to do. Because before I received Christ, I thought as the naturalist, I saw everything as cause and effect. It, it didn't really have any understanding. But then when I became a Christian, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I had to reset my mind, not be brainwashed, but understand that my reality is different. And that's where we're failing. We're missing that step to learn reality from a different focus. And it has to do with our worldview. A disciple is a learner of someone. Jesus says this right after the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above his master. That's meaning teacher here. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his teacher. In other words, there was this understanding, and, and discipleship didn't come from Jesus. There was disciples before Jesus. Disciple meant a learner. 
But Jesus says, hey, the, the whole point of becoming a disciple is to learn everything the teacher has, to be like the teacher. Bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this. So what I want to see for us as the believer is we're to be like Christ. How is it we view these things? If, if, if I don't take that step of, of a reset in learning new behavior, then I can become saved. I can believe that God is real, that He's Yahweh, He's our Father. I can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son and that He died for me and that my sins are forgiven and that He's allowed the Holy Spirit to be His gift to me now. I can believe those things and never grow any further than seeing the Bible as a bunch of rules. And if I have no true relationship with God, then that's what I see the Bible as. It's rules. Church is a place you just go to. You got to give up Sunday morning. You know, it's tough, isn't it? You got to give up Wednesday night. Well, I'm not going to be that committed. I'm just give up Sunday morning, maybe once a month. It's rules. It's this, this grieving that takes place because we're not understanding that I have to be changed, that there's a whole new focus. We should strive to be such a learner of Christ that He defines our reality. I want you to think about that. That we don't see from the, the years of experience of whatever we've learned in life, but that He God's Word is our anchor. It is our reality. It is what we see. I think, again, we're missing this. Um, talking about worldviews and how we interpret differently. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand, you've been to the Grand Canyon. I want to go one day. One day I'll get there. You know, we can go to the Grand Canyon, and the pictures I see... Um, of the Grand Canyon, I see this massive, massive creation of God. If you don't believe in God, or sometimes even if you do, if you don't have a creation kind of thought process, what you see is erosion that took place over millions of years. And, and scientists could even tell us the flow of water and how long it takes the flow of water over rock to cut through a sediment layer. Because you can see on the, the canyon wall all the different sediment layers. And so if, if that's what I've been taught, and that's what our children are taught every day in public school. If that's what I'm taught, then that's what I see. It makes sense, okay? This is a cause and effect. We see this data, the same data. Now as, as a Christian, we could look at that same thing and understand that there have been times of localized flooding that on a much smaller level have produced the same look, the same sediment in rock. You see, it's been compacted together. And so as a Christian, I can look at the Grand Canyon and say, you know what? It does not dispute the Word of God. There was a global flood, and from that global flood, it created exactly what we see as the Grand Canyon. Now, some of you think, well, that's crazy. Here again, I'm going to ask you, do you see, is your view completely of everything you see in the world from Scripture, or is it from your own discernment between all the things that are given to you? Let me carry this a little step further biblically. Go with me, if you would, to Matthew 11. We're going to get into some Scripture now. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus is he's doing some woe to's just before this. He's telling people what they're not doing right, and that's not where we're going today. But here's what he says. Jesus speaking. He's speaking to his disciples, and he's speaking to us all. In verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Most of us know that scripture. You've heard it before, over and over and over. All right? Do you believe it? I'm going to go back to the first question. Do you really believe that? 
most of us will say, I do believe that. I do believe. Jesus' yoke is easy. And we start to think, well, you know, whatever it is that's so difficult in life because my reality is not matching to what Jesus says, we say, well, it must be that I haven't absorbed His yoke right, or, or you know, that it must be me that has fallen somewhere. Listen to the promise of God's Word. He says here, hey, life is tough. That's your labor. It's real. Jesus is speaking. He says, there are times that are tough. That's labor. He says, come to me. Trust in me. Rest. Be refreshed. Do you really believe that in the Son of God? Do you ground yourself to that point in Christ that I will look at everything else and that in what He, he tells me in becoming a learner of Him, learning and being as Jesus tells me to interpret and to look, that actually even in all of the trouble I will be refreshed. He goes on, take my yoke. And what He's saying here? See things from my point of view. Let me define the reality that you need to be living and then he says, learn from me. Learn from me. Be my disciple. Let him be the teacher. Learn from him. See things the way I see them. And notice that he says, for I am meek. Jesus is not prideful. He's not judgmental. He's not waiting to pounce on you or to stone you or to do any of those things. He's meek. He's waiting for you to be connected in real belief that he is the foundation, and you shall find rest for your soul. Worries removed. Notice, it, not problems removed. Worries. The challenges of life, I can see them all for what they are because my view is sitting at Jesus' feet. I, I do all of this to, to bring us to a point for a reason. Again, I think this is in some of our lives the great disconnect. We understand the doctrine. We understand the players, who God is, who Jesus is, and how sin is forgiven. But we struggle. We struggle to say, okay, I've got to stop and learn something new. I can remember uh, I was raised in this church, I was baptized in this church, I was spanked in this church. Um, all of those. I can, now some of you too, I just saw your eyes. <laughs> some of you needed to be. Ha, ah, gotcha. Um, I can remember when I decided in my life as an adult to really give myself to the Lord. It was before the ministry, but I can remember that reset. And before then, I didn't know it. You know, I've told you before, I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. That's true. I was so full of pride. I was going to do it my way. Now, I had good reasons in my mind. I had justified everything I was doing. I was justifying while I was working 120 hours a week and going to do this, going to do it for my family. But the truth is, it was pride. I wanted to be the chief. I wanted to be the boss. I wanted to be the one that people would want to look up to and respect. And I went and I did whatever I needed to in work, travel, school. There was times I stepped on people that were in the way. I was not the Christian man, even close that I am today. And I remember that wrestle, oh, the wrestle that took place, where I said, okay, this is not just me saying something. I've got to change. And you see, many of you have found yourself right at that point. You've done that. You've knew there had to be a change. But this is that disconnect. Because the day I step back out the next day, there's the devil and all that temptation and all the old way of viewing everything is still there. And it was at a point of understanding, no, no, I, I've got to start new. 
I've got to refocus in every way. I've got to actually believe what I say I believe. But no, I have to put it in practice that God's Word is truth, that, that that's how I'm going to define reality. What I found is my position changed in politics. In fact, I don't know that there is a political party in Kearney. There is the Bible. It's when I notice that my understanding of who I am supposed to be as a son, as a father, as a husband, as an individual, all began to change, and I'm still working on it today. But there was this place of rethinking. There, there had to be a, a new training over time that has happened from God's Word, and most especially, time with Jesus. I've lost friends because of it. Probably good, to be perfectly honest with you. But I've lost connections because of my faith, but all those that I've gained. Where am I going with all of this? John 10.10 10 says this, The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I ask you, do you believe that? 1 John 5, 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God does not have life. There is no, um, no real life outside of learning what Jesus is calling us to learn. Colossians 2, 2, 3 says this about knowledge and understanding. Uh, he says that their hearts knit together in love and unto the riches of full assurance of understanding. Isn't that what we're all doing? Searching over and over for more, for more understanding, for clarity in life. And if your search is not in Christ, it's in the world. But understand what this, this verse is saying. There's the full assurance of understanding, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It is all in Him. It's in His Word that has to be our viewpoint. How is it that we unlock these treasures of wisdom and knowledge? We become true learners of Christ. Colossians 1.13 gives us an example that we have been delivered out of darkness into light that's that first step as believers when, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through our faith. We've been delivered from darkness into light. It's, it's where life really begins for us. And we need to understand that our change is not something that happens because of a decision. It happens because we decide to learn differently. Why do I continue going over this? Men, God has called us to a very unique thing that He's given to nobody else. All men. God created us uniquely and wonderfully made. And He created us with purpose, unique purpose. And that purpose, like all, starts first of all to be in a real relationship with Him. To want to learn to, to become just like Christ. Past the relationship, He has given man responsibilities. I mean, no offense if you're offended, forgive me. But two places, Scripture is very clear. God has called man to lead his home and to lead in the church. Now, that's, that's not seen everywhere else. But in those two places, there's no denying what Scripture Calls. Men, it's a responsibility. You don't get to say, okay, I think I'm up for that task. No, you were created for that task. You were completely created for that task. And you're going to be held accountable for that task. You don't get to say, no, it's not for me. No, it is for you. 
Scripture tells us, Genesis chapter 2. He, he goes on in, in Ephesians chapter 5. And we could look at the qualifications of different leadership as we look in Timothy and Titus and, and other books. But understand these things. And, and here's the, the, the other thing with that. He's created us to be able to handle things differently than He's created others to do. And I want you to know, whether you want it or not, whether you're a father by blood or not, no matter what, God has created you, and wherever you are in age, whether you're young or more experienced in life, you are an example that people are looking to and saying, I want to be just like you. It's just where it is. It's how God created things. Now, our world right now is really trying to shake that up. <laughs> It's trying to mess that up in all kinds of ways. But listen to me what the Word of God says, because that's what I want to talk to us from, the Word of God. Let me ask you this. No judgment intended, complete grace. If your son decides to be exactly who you are, will you be happy with that? For those of you who have daughters, if your son grows up to be exactly who you are, would you be happy for him to marry your daughter? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand that qualification? Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> I'm saying, are you leading your family in such a way that you would be proud of your son or daughter? to look at you for answers. And if not, what are you going to do to change that? I'm not saying are you perfect because none of us will be perfect. But I will tell you what America needs right now, what church needs right now, what this church needs right now is men to step up to the biblical responsibility that God has given us. We've got great men in this church, great men that are leading with that biblical responsibility. But it's not just for the leaders, it's for all. And so I ask you this out of grace, mercy, and love. Are you where you need to be? I was listening to a sermon. Um, I listened to a lot of sermons, but um, the Brooklyn, Ta Brooklyn Tabernacle and... Um, I've lost the pastor's name. It'll come to me in a minute. It's not important. He would say it was not important. Jim Cimbala. He was, uh, he was speaking of a New Testament reference where uh, after the day of Pentecost and there's mighty, mighty things happening in the book of Acts in the church that Peter is walking and people are literally lining up. Uh, they're sick just so his shadow goes over them. This morning I was out walking um, early it's refreshing just, just doing a little prayer and, and talking. And, and to tell you how early it was, my shadow was way bigger than I am. All right? That tells you the sun is just peeking up over the trees because my shadow went on. I was long and slender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't like to look at my shadow at lunchtime. It looks totally different. <laughs> but the thought process of his message was this. Whether you know it or not, your shadow is touching and affecting all kinds of people around you. Is it affecting them in the way you want it to affect them? Is it affecting them positively? Or is it affecting them negatively? Men, I, I, I want to talk to some of you. I just know this. I know it in my heart. There's some right now listening today that believe in God, that believe in Jesus Christ, that who have professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there's been the disconnect of the reset in learning. And there's been a try of trying to take pieces of the Bible with everything I've already learned in life and mesh those two together and not reset. And I'm telling you, it is a life of strife and a life of constant battle. And you will always have regrets if that's what you're doing. I lived it. There's days it still tries to come up. You got to reset. 
you got to change the starting point. Your family needs you to be from that starting point. There's wives. They're just, they're just longing for husbands to be the biblical leader of the home. This church body, I'm telling you, we're starving for leadership. Look in your bulletin. I did something on Wednesday night. Look in your bulletin, the first page as you open up the bulletin. Some of you don't even know where your bulletin is already. I asked on Wednesday night, what is the vision of the church? Not a single person could tell me. <laughs> as it is stated, as it's been in front of you for the last two months, it's to bring the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And just under that you see that there is the actual mission statement of our church that, that we will actively go out proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we will do the Great Commission. You know, that we will bring people into the church and actively teach them and engage them in the walk and understanding of who Jesus is. For, forget the bulletin. Go to the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse number 19. What does it tell us? Jesus says, I'm with you. Go to all nations, teaching them. Teaching them what? He says in the next verse, in verse 20, everything that I've ever commanded you. And he says, lo, I am with you even to the ends of the earth. Notice he says, don't go make converts. That's not the Great Commission. He didn't say just go get somebody saved. He says, go. He says, teach them everything that I've taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's bringing them into the church and, and full membership as we look at this. But he says, teach them. There is a learning that has to take place. And men, it is our responsibility. I don't have any other way to say it. God says, men, I've called you to this. It is our job. How in the world did the preacher get there from Genesis 6? Go back with me as we start to close. Genesis chapter 6, I asked you, did you believe this? that all of this is in motion and God has chosen Noah and that He's going to give them 120 years and a flood is going to come and kill everyone that does not repent. You said you believe it. Well, let's look in Genesis chapter 6. Let's start with me. It says in verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How did he find grace? We, we look in Hebrews, it says because of his faith, not because of his action, but because of his faith. And notice it goes on, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. Was he perfect? He wasn't perfect, but God sees him that way because of his faith. You see, when we become believers, our unrighteousness is removed, and the very righteousness of God is given to us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 19-21. It says, And Noah, verse 10, begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Turn with me, if you would. God tells him to make the, the uh, ark, tells him exactly how to do it. He's called because of his faith. And notice what it says in verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. God says judgment's coming, and it's real. We've been told of a judgment that's coming again. And notice in verse 18, But with thee, God's speaking to Noah. He says, But with thee will I establish my covenant. It is an agreement of God. And thou shalt come into thy ark, you and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Do you see the importance? If Noah wasn't a man of faith, then not only would Noah die, he could have led his wife to perish, and his sons and his daughters to perish, and their husbands and wives. Do you see the effect of a lack of biblical leadership and how far it goes? 
I asked you men and women, do you believe this account is real? I believe it with all of my heart. Because in my retraining, in my totally reset of life, totally different, even though I grew up in church, in my rethinking from the viewpoint of God's Word, that's how I see everything. There's not a single question in life that cannot be answered from the viewpoint of God's Word. And that's how i got to live my life. And I struggle. Man, there's times the world wants to creep into that, but that's how we have to live our life. And I will tell you, oh, what freedom and grace and love and mercy and acceptance comes in when you understand it's not about the rules. It's about a relationship. It's about a new starting point, a starting point that God's called me to, where, where it's not about rock throwing and judgment, but no, it's about mercy. In Matthew chapter 5, and I'll close, we've been going through on Wednesday nights Jesus' um, first message. Yeah, it's not loaded. We'll find it. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 3. Jesus' first preaching. He says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is, you're blessed when you don't feel like you have much of his spirit as the starting point. In other words, you start to realize it's not about me and my power and my strength and what I think is right. It's about Him. I will tell you, for Carney, I wanted the earth before I really gave myself to Him. I tried to obtain it in every means. Listen to what this verse says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is an understanding that, that we're nothing without Him. When we get to that point, and yours is the kingdom of heaven, you've been given the kingdom of heaven at that point. He says, next, blessed are they that mourn. That mourning is directly tied to an understanding that I'm poor in spirit. Man, I've been doing it wrong so long. I've been relying on myself instead of relying on Him. And, and it, it breaks my heart, but He says, don't worry, you're blessed when you mourn because Jesus says, I'm going to comfort you. It's a new way of life. He says in verse 5, blessed are the meek when I understand to remove my pride. Oh, that was a big one for me, and sometimes I still fight it. To remove my pride, he says, Blessed are they that meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All those things I was trying to obtain, he just constantly blesses us with. He goes on, Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You start to taste and see, is what Proverbs says, that the Lord is good. And you just want more and more of it. And you hunger and you thirst. You just can't wait to get back in His Word to talk to Him, just to have a conversation with God, not rush off to something else. He says, blessed are you with hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you're going to be filled. He's going to give you a feeling that this world cannot give. Blessed are the merciful. Oh, it's hard to get to a point that we are actually merciful to others. But see, it's all this is growth, one right on top of the other for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's that constant growth that's happening because my starting point is anew. My view of everything is with Christ at the center of my life. He says, blessed are you pure in heart, for you shall see God. Lastly, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. We can actually become those peacemakers without judgment, without hatred without talking about others, peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. God has called all of us to be in a relationship with Him. Men, I want you to understand, if you are walking with the Lord like Noah, amen, praise the Lord for the relationship, and we got some good ones. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you haven't found His yoke to be easy, stop fighting and pull the other direction. When He says He puts that yoke on, there's usually another animal right beside Him, and you're yoked to another an animal, a more senior animal. 
that's going to lead you in the right way. It's saying when you put on Christ's yoke that I'm going to be a learner of Him. Stop fighting it. Learn from the viewpoint of Scripture and allow your life to be blessed. Allow God to strengthen you with the power and the ability to be the men that God's called you to be, to lead your families, to lead this church, to lead companies, to be workers, to do, make an impact in the world for Christ. Man, God's called us all. I don't know where you are today. I'm going to bring us to a close. I just feel led on something, though, as, as Kathy just plays. If, if you will allow me to do this again, no judgment. I don't have the right to judge anybody. Complete mercy. Listen to the words that were said here today. And if you're a man, would you stand and allow me just to pray for you right where you are? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Our men here today, would you just stand? God has put a tremendous responsibility on each and every one of us. I mean, it's massive. But he's also said, I will give you everything you need to do it. But it's got to be with him. And if it's not, then you're, you're, you're fighting. You'll never be at peace. You never get the fulfillment that he's called you to do. Look, look left and right. Look at these ladies that are sitting, whether they're your wives or someone else, someone's child. Just look around. They need you, each one of you. They need you to step in the responsibility, to continue fulfilling the responsibility that God has called you to do. They need that. They need it. Our children across the street, they need it. It's a rewarding thing. Man, thank you for what you're doing already, but understand, God is calling us to a responsibility, and may we not let that responsibility fall. Lastly, understand this. No judgment. That if we're not where we need to be, we can change that today. I just ask you as I pray for you, that you ask God to begin that change in your life now. If your point of view, your worldview is not where it needs to be, then let today be that reset, that that's where you're going to start. Would you make that prayer as I pray together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you now, and God, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace. Oh, your forgiveness, God, is so good to us. God, you forgive. There's no sin. God, that you won't forgive except us denying who you are. God, I believe the truths of your word. We understand the concept of sin and judgment, but oh, there's grace, but not, grace is not to be taken advantage of. And God, I thank you that you have defined the family in such a way that you've defined the church, that you've called us, God, to live with you in, in such a way you tell us, look, you, you want to have the best relationship you could have. Here it is. You want to live the life that's the, the, the most fulfilled. Here it is. And God, thank you for the call on both men and women. But God, I specifically ask you now, you know the hearts of every man standing here today. God, I first, I just thank you for them. I thank you for each one of them. God, how you have brought them here today, how they labor for you in so many ways. God, I thank you for those that have a, a spiritual maturity with them, that you're guiding them in such a way and that they've given their life to you. And God, I thank you that there are those that, that really haven't yet, but God, that, that you've allowed them to be right here, right now. And God, as they have been conflicted in what to do, would you remove that conflict? Understand, no judgment at all, God. Would you just allow grace to enter into their life that they can start new today? God, we as people, individuals need it. Our families need it. The church needs it. And God, may we be who you've designed us to be, 
and may we impact the world for Christ. God be with us. May we enjoy this day. May we celebrate this day. God, thank you for these men. Just uplift them in spirit. And God, would you guide us? Would you lead us every day? God, we love you. Bless these men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.